Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cana Connection podcast. I am your host today, Jack Murray, and we have a very special guest with us here, Jason Chung, the director and esports business professor at NYU. Jason, it's great to have you on today, and I'm excited for the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. So to start off, Jason, please tell us about yourself, how you got into esports, and you know what you're currently doing in esports. Yeah, so uh, you know, I'm an educator and attorney. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm the director of the Esports and Gaming Initiative at NYU. Um, I'm also teaching sport management, uh, and uh, as an uh, as an attorney, I'm also the head of the Esports Gaming and Media Practice at my law firm of uh, Zuber Lawler LLP. Um, you know, uh, how I got into the e- uh, esports industry is pretty interesting. I think the more interesting way is how I got into video games. Right? Uh, you know, obviously, it started with me. Uh, not to date myself with an NES. Right. And uh, growing up in Montreal, Canada, uh, you know, about half the people I ended up going to school with or, or being friends with ended up in the video games industry because there's a pretty big hub there. So, you know, I've always been passionate about uh, gaming from, you know, of course, the games are great, but also on the business side, I've, I've always been exposed to it. And, and, you know, when you go to law school, the last thing you think about, hey, is I'm going to end up in the video games industry or, or, or teaching esports or things like that. But it just sort of ended up that way, um, you know, mainly because, uh, you know, I, I, you know, my background ethically is Korean, uh, you know, grew up playing StarCraft in, in Toronto with my friends, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I knew the uh, I knew about esports I knew about competitive gaming. I, you know, as an attorney, I was working at NYU, uh, not as an attorney, but, uh, you know, doing research on, on sports related stuff. And then, you know. A few years ago, you know, like about five, six years ago, uh, there esports sort of came up in academic circles of like, hey, people seem to be really interested in this and there's a business around it. What can we do? And so, um, you know, the dean, uh, you know, uh, Vince Gennaro basically came to me and said, like, hey, we, we need somebody to put a course together. Right. We want to be able to educate our students on what this is. And I said, uh, yeah, sure. I'll l- let me do it. Right. You know, I understand the industry. You know, I, you know, I, I you know, obviously I uh, like competitive gaming and everything like that. So, like, let me put it together. And um, I put together the first uh, business of esports course at NYU. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I moved on from NYU. Uh, you know, I joined the full-time faculty at NYU. I moved on to build a couple of uh, BS, uh, uh, like, Bachelor of Science programs at a, at a uh, business school in Connecticut. And I built up uh, esports and gaming a uh, major, a minor, a master's program uh, in esports business as well. And NYU uh, said that they wanted to, to reinvest and, and expand their offerings in this space. So uh, I'm back at NYU now. And as an attorney, you know, I've been working on it as well. You know, just that there's a lot going on. And obviously, uh, you know, Web3 things that want to do things uh, in the video game space and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I have a, I actually co-host a, uh, a podcast with a fellow uh, colleague of mine. Uh, and it's called What the Meta, and we talk about the metaverse, right? And uh, some of that actually touches on on gaming as well, right? What what the, what implications does it have? You know, what does it mean for the industry as a whole? Well, you know, what is the implication of the technology? So, it's interesting. My love of technology, my love of sport, and everything, and my love of business all came together, and here we are. That's amazing, and you know, I wish there were courses like that when I was in college. I I recently graduated from George Mason University as a sport management major, and I was always looking for an esports course to take, but there were none. You know, there were textbooks that included esports as an emerging industry to watch in traditional sports, but I felt that those really didn't do it justice or really understand understand esports at all. So it's really great to see collegiate esports, you know, expanding across the country and really becoming recognized. It's truly deserved. You know, GMU is actually now offering an esports course and is working on developing an esports minor as well, which again is really great. Scholastic and collegiate esports are a really large focus area uh, for us here at Cana. Um, but to get back on track, could you give us a background of the esports program at NYU? And then also in your mind, what is something that can help take collegiate esports programs and competitions to the next level of success and sustainability? Yeah, I mean, uh, the curriculum at NYU is, uh, you know, uh, being built, right? And that's the reason why I came back in. Uh, We obviously have our uh, business of esports course, which is hugely popular, both at the undergrad level and at the graduate level as well. Uh, So it's been, uh, that's been pretty good. Uh, And then, uh, you know, what, what I've been doing is layering on what, what kind of track can our students take, right? So, you know, I think every college and university basically thinks about, hey, is it a minor? Is it a major? You know, can we sustain everything like this? And, you know, having done a major, a minor and a a, a master's program before, you know, I thought, let's scale it up, right? You know, at the end of the day, even finding people to teach this field uh, well and uh, holistically, people who can understand the business side uh, as well as teach, 
uh, it's it's difficult to find in any industry, right? So let's scale it up. And right now we're, we're aiming for a track. And what I've also been doing is building up uh, sort of advanced seminars and consulting courses for students, right? So for instance, my graduate students this semester are working together with uh, with Sport5, which is a major sort of uh, sport marketing agency, uh, you know, internationally. Uh, I think they, they say they have a billion dollars in revenue a year and they have an esports and gaming division. So we're actually working on... Uh, <clears throat> a consulting course with them. We're actually doing, um, you know, working on a live case, uh, doing an industry report, that kind of stuff for them. In the fall, we'll be do we have a course with Red Bull, uh, you know, to figure out who uh, New York City gamers are, and uh, we'll also be doing a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion course. You know, not 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 only as like a you know business responsibility or obligation, but really as a business opportunity. What does it mean for the sports industry? What does it mean for the esports industry? How can we use, uh, you know. Uh, just a broader fandom to advance, uh, you know, these industries, right? Um, I think for for too too long we've just thought of it as something, some corporate social responsibility thing, but it's not. It's actually something that we can do business in. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that I'm bringing. You know, a little bit of practical, uh, practical, uh, experiential learning for students, as well as you know, solid uh, baseline of what what is this, right? Because it's amazing. Some students come in, they know uh, probably more than I do, right? In terms of the competitive scene and, you know, they know every minute sort of business uh, or, or, you know, competitive transaction that occurred. And some students come in and go like, well, I think I played a video game once, uh, you know, uh, you know, 10 years ago. So it's, it, you know, leveling out that sort of uh, um, uh, knowledge and, and, and differences in knowledge is always a fun challenge. And uh, at the and I think it's, it's great to see people grow together, right? And, and tackle a challenge together. So, uh, long story short, yeah, building out uh, a, a track, uh, doing lots of uh, uh, more experiential learning as well as, you know, uh, really uh, building up a, a, a track where students can learn and uh, be recognized for understanding the industry, but also having the creativity to tackle business challenges in that industry. That's amazing and, and very good to hear. We here at Kana talk a lot about data and the importance of data, which is especially true for esports curriculum building because, you know, there really needs to be more information available to help build a stronger knowledge base around the industry in general. You know, ensuring there is a well-educated group of staff members to create and instruct these courses is vital to the growth and success of collegiate esports programs. Yet the data that can help with this is mostly un unavailable or unattainable. Uh, so with that being said, how do you see more data accessibility and data analytics supporting the growth of collegiate esports? Okay. So the thing is like, um, you know, I think, I think uh, data and data analytics is huge, right? It's a, you know, it's, it's a big part of any sort of, uh, you know, sport industry or any sort of industry and really getting access to clean, reliable data is, is at the front of everything, at the forefront of everything, but it's just difficult to capture, right? You know, what are you capturing? How are you capturing it? Are you capturing it more on the competitive side? Are you capturing it on the business side? What are the metrics? Uh, you know, what are the key performance indicators? All that kind of stuff is very, very difficult. Uh, and one of the challenges in just in terms of teaching, but just industry wide is that uh, all of this data is, is, is captured by a number of companies, but you know, um, are they capturing the right thing? You know, uh, do, are they committed to capturing in the right way? Uh, you know, uh, can, do they actually share it in a way that's meaningful uh, that, that that the industry can use? You know, I mean, even on the business side of things, uh, New Zoo was a was a you know a big sort of content provider, and on the business side of things, really trying to you know. Uh, tell you how big the opportunity was in video games and esports and 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 everything like that. It was used by every single VC to to basically um, uh, you, you know structure their decks. Right, this is how big the industry is. This is what the opportunity is. But they've decided to exit the space. Right, uh, and actually they've they faced some criticism by, for maybe overhyping the space as a business opportunity. So uh, look, I mean, it, it's still early days in this industry. Right, um, you know, finding data, you know, basic leveraging data. Uh, whether it's competitive data, whether it's business insights, all of that is is still being cleaned up, still being negotiated, um, and you know the, the the company or the companies that really figure that out or the people that figure it out will really have a leg up and be helpful for, to the industry. And you know I, I'm not too worried about it. I think eventually that'll come uh, pretty soon. At the end of the day, this industry is pretty young, right? I mean, if you ask people you know, five, if you ask me even five years ago, uh, hey, could you make a career of this? This did not exist uh, five years ago, right? Like the, what I'm doing now, just it, it just didn't exist. If, if you ask somebody, hey, would you want to do data analytics and esports 10 years ago? They would have said, what What the hell are you talking about? What is esports, right? So, um, you know, 
this is an evolution and it's and it's a very big business challenge and it's a very big challenge on the competitive side but it's it's something that is a natural challenge and it's a continuous challenge right i mean uh, even if you think about traditional sport, you know, you think about how people used to measure in, in Major League Baseball, you know, how good a pitcher was, right? You know, wins, ERA, you know, uh, you know, that was it, right? And as, as, as recently as the 90s, maybe the 2000s, and now it's whip, it's all different kinds of stuff. So, you know, like, look, in terms of data, in terms of how it's presented, uh, even how it's communicated fans, how value is communicated, all that is a continuous, continuous negotiation process. And we're early days. So, Hopefully, uh, there'll be companies like yours that step up and really add a lot of value to the space. Well, that's our goal, right? So we don't want to we don't want to be chaffed. We don't want to be just there trying to not provide pro, you know, valuable service to the industry. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll actually give you an example. Like uh, for instance, you know, it's not it's important not just to have information, but like good information, right? Um, you know, some of my students are working on a, you know, on an industry report, right? You know, really demonstrating what they know about the industry. Problem is that there are so many badly designed, uh, you know, badly communicated data, but also like badly written AI generated, clearly AI bot generated, uh, you know, articles online. Uh, so if you try to find information, it's, you actually have to do more triage of, you know, filtering out junk rather than actually collecting information. And, that isn't good for anybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, finding the information uh, and being able to trust somebody with it, I think is the most important part. And, and in building up that trust and being a good partner to the industry, you know, as you know, just always a constant challenge, right? Um, and also differentiating between, you know, the, the, the work and the, what you do versus, you know, uh, other places where you might not be as enthused about their product. I mean, that's obviously, I think, a, a constant challenge as well. Most definitely. Yeah, that's a great point. I think the entire industry knows that data accessibility and analytics are crucial uh, to support the growth of esports and gaming. But other than that current issue, what are some other major issues you see with how the esports industry is currently structured or configured? And what are some silver linings to these issues? Yeah, I mean, uh, the... the the esports industry is as a whole is facing a lot of challenges, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe this is my bias as an attorney and a former government uh, employee kind of thing. But, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with governance, right? I mean, it's great to have analytics. It's great to have all these services and solutions. But the but the issue is um, if if it services a, a competitive structure or, or a, a competitive environment that's not sustainable, you know, what, you know, what, what can you do in it, right? So, uh, you know, I think what a lot of these pro teams and leagues are finding is that current sort of uh, uh, architecture is not sustainable, right? You know, economically, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, uh, it's great to have the top people competing against each other, but people also need to make money. You know, team owners need to make money. And this is, you know, this isn't like a black hearted thing where people are shutting down esports uh, teams or, or, or laying off people because they want to, they're doing it because the ROI and the return on investment is just, it's just not as, as, as fruitful as people thought. Right. And so if we really want to provide these services and solutions to, to, to the industry, the industry also has to mature. Right. Uh, and they have to be in a position to be financially viable for the next little while. Um, but they also have to be in a position where it's professional enough that you can take these insights and actually do something with them, right? Uh, you know, if, if you just continue the way you're going and you just throw money at the wall and hope it sticks and, you know, hey, uh, you know, you just hope that it grows, you can grow out of the problem. I don't think we're at that point yet, right? We actually need to do things like build the ecosystem, uh, you know, open up everything to different people, um, give comfort to sponsors and, uh, you know, you know, media rights people and stuff like that, who, who are going to sustain you financially, but then you also have to educate fans, right? Uh, a lot of times, like, you know, somebody will, you know, cite a statistic at me, right? Like this person did this. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Because, you know, educating the fandom has been kind of almost secondary. Like, it, you know, the whole esports industry has been about servicing the hardcore player. Uh, the hardcore fan, right? Like, you know, really servicing, you know, doubling down on who's already inside the ecosystem. But it's got to be a little bit more than that as well, right? You know, uh, we, we got to be able to communicate that just like, you know, um, saber metrics and, you know, all that kind of stuff really helped baseball and that general fandom. Uh, we, you know, we still have a long ways to go, I think, to, to educate 
uh, everybody up and down the esports ladder, right from right from ownership uh, down to fans. Yeah, no, agreed. Yeah, getting the average the average player, the average gamer, the average just Joe out there to understand the level of uh, where everything's involved. It's 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 right now the wild west still, right? Too many people yeah. going out there shooting around trying to figure out everything not not everybody understands where it's going or what it all encompasses and everything like that and i see many of the different organizations that we talked to that jack has brought to uh the podcast and everything like that all all trying to find that that level base that understanding and get everything organized and establish the communities and grow it from that ground up perspective absolutely jack any other questions then the last question you make a really, really strong point about servicing, you know, everyone in the industry and not just the hardcore stakeholders, but also everyone that helps build the entire ecosystem. And we see this trying to be established as many esports federations or governing bodies have surfaced, but they're really struggling to establish themselves due to their relationships with, you know, game developers and publishers, which are the added level of difficulty that traditional sports really don't have to maneuver around. Uh, with, with these video game developers and publishers owning all the rights for the games being played, how should esports federations or governing bodies interact with or include the yeah. developers and publishers, and why is this crucial? Okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, Jack, like uh, I think that's a great question. You know, uh, esports federating and, uh, federations and governing bodies. Uh, I think it's really interesting because we're seeing a big cultural disconnect of how people deal with uh, esports, right? So if you're European, and I was uh, I was in South Korea at the International Esports Federations uh, Summit. Uh, earlier this year, and uh, they were asking, well, how do we get, you know, publishers to work with us? You know, how do we get them to to be part of the, uh, to uh, recognize governing bodies? And my point was, you know, if we're in North America and the U.S. in particular, right, um, publishers have all the rights. You know, they have the intellectual property. It's their game, right? Like, you know, why would they agree to a top-down structure where somebody else is governing their 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 intellectual property and and doing what the, what they want in the competitive sphere, sphere right? So, um, you know, getting buy-in is critical. Uh, I, it's really interesting. France has said that the you know they create this sort of like esports uh, body and they want to do uh, they want to do more direct government regulation to help grow the space. All fantastic ideas, but then somebody asked them, hey. Um, you know, have you talked to the video game publishers? And they said, well, it's on the list. And I don't understand how that works. Absolutely, absolutely. And there, by the way, this is not just to dunk on France. This is something that every international federation sort of deals with as well. Like they, they basically say, hey, we're going to eventually get to talking with the publishers. We're going to eventually talk to the athletes. Well, how do you actually launch a sport without having the buy-in of the of the actual people that provide the playing field, right? It doesn't make uh, doesn't make a ton of sense. So, uh, really, at the end of the day, it's it's every single stakeholder has to, I think, work together with publisher and communicate to them what the value here is, right? Because right now, uh, just to be brutally just to be brutal about it, esports is a marketing exercise for the video game, right? They make all their money off the video game. If you ask even people at the you know at riot about league of legends the you know they used to lose a hundred million dollars a year to promote it as an esport right uh, and granted they got people and, and and users out of it uh but eventually when tencent said it came in and said hey you can't lose a hundred million dollars anymore even after years all they'll say now is we don't lose money anymore which is not the same as saying we're profitable right so um, at the end of the, you know, so what do we do? Uh, we have to convince, I think, publishers about the value of the esports space, where it can go, uh, what a business, how, what, what kind of business opportunity it represents for them, and really where uh, we can take it together, right? And in, not having ownership over it, over, you know, and taking a slice of it away from the video game publishers, but how we can actually grow the space together and how we can be joint stakeholders, right? Um, you know, it has to make sense for them financially, but it'll probably make more sense for them financially if they're not directly running it day to day or, you know, because that's not what video game publishers do, right? Um, and maybe it does for certain ones like Riot, where, you know, I know from the founding days, they were really passionate about the competitive side and the online play. But I mean, if you're if you're a traditional publisher, uh, you know, let's just say Activision Blizzard, although they, you know, they have demonstrated they want to do more in esports, you know, they they're still video game publishers, right? They make money off the game, so you know why are you know 
to do esports and to convince them to do esports in addition to what they already do as their main sort of bread and butter, it's going to be complicated. But if we can come in as a community and say, hey, you know, license it to us or work together or let's do a joint venture. Let's actually put this together in a different way uh, and uh, and let's all sort of grow the, you know, let's have multiple people growing the, the size of the industry together. I think that's a conversation that needs to take place. And I don't think it can be dictated to the video game publishers. I don't think I don't think the French government can come in and say, hey, guess what? Uh, uh, you know, Riot Games, we're going to take it over and we're going to it's not going to work. Right. So ultimately, this has to be viewed as a partnership. This has to be viewed as a negotiation and uh, it has to view, be viewed as a multi party responsibility by all parties. And it's going to take some time and some convincing for that to happen, because if you own something, uh, convincing people to share, other people can try to convince you to share, but it's going to take a long time to to convince you uh, that that's the right thing to do. Agreed. Agreed. Well, um, that was fantastic. And Jason, thank you for joining us today. I would like to have you back on, especially whenever uh, our regular host, Rob, is available. I know he's going to have some questions, particularly about the stuff we were talking about at the very end here, because there is a uh, uh, in one of our other previous podcasts, I had mm -hmm. talked about, uh, brought up a question at the very end about kind of just that thing. It's like there needs to almost be like in traditional sports, nobody owns the sport, right? right? There's there's the sport and then mm -hmm. everybody has their flavor of it. And yeah, you, you make money on the other end selling merch and, you know, getting all the team stuff and everything like that. And there's tons of yeah. money in sports, but the actual sport itself is not owned by anybody. And there's like mm -hmm. some some version of that that needs to evolve into an esport and probably several esports because there's going to be different genres and stuff like that but i don't know how that how that plays out i don't know what the answer is for that and, and how that <laughs> everybody's that's figuring part, out part of that that thing that will get it on that same playing field and also make it like available for the your average person to understand how it all works together like uh you know at least from that 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 base knowledge area um thank you for joining us yeah. today where can people reach you and uh what would you like to share out there yeah. uh people can reach me on linkedin uh that's the easiest place uh you know uh but, and then the other part is through twitter i guess for now uh at chunk sports awesome awesome thank you for joining us today a big thanks goes out to Jason Chung from NYU for joining us today on the Kana Connection podcast. If you would like to hear more of the Kana Connection, please head on over to our website at kanaLLC.com. Of course, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many of the other popular podcast platforms. You can also catch this on video over on our YouTube channel if you go to youtube.com at Kana Connection, you'll be able to find us there. So this is Koa Beam signing off for Jack Murray and the rest of the Kana Connection podcast crew, reminding you to analyze, assess, and execute. And we'll catch you next time.